On September 1, 1939, a million and a half men strong German force started its invasion of Poland. Weeks later, the Soviet Union joined in from the other side. Even though the Polish army achieved the size of a million troops strong as the war went on, it eventually caved in. This video asks could a much smaller but much much better equipped army from the future change history? Could modern day Polish military fight off the Germans? It's always fun to try and change history, even without modern day weapons many want to try the impossible and defend Poland. And you can try too by playing Call of War, which is sponsoring this video. It's a free online strategy game I tried. You fight other players in real time. The game start is historically accurate, but then it's up to you how you'll change history. In the game, you build powerful armies and combine different units such as infantry, tanks, planes and ships to maximize the effectiveness of your attacks. You can declare war on your neighbors and enter alliances with other players. Your objective is to conquer the whole world. Call of War is giving away Binko viewers a great new player pack. One month of high command account and 13,000 gold. Available for 30 days only, so hurry up and click on the link below the video. Let's go back to our time traveling polls. In the real timeline, the German attack was swift as their advantage in firepower, technology and training was considerable. The manpower difference was also always there, as Poland started proper mobilization very late. On September the 1st, when the Germans already started the battle, Poland had half a million reservists mobilized. Even worse, just a quarter of a million were actually equipped and on their positions. Germany attacked from two main directions. Group Army North had a bit fewer troops than Group Army South, but altogether they still had a million and a half equipped and ready troops of which over a million crossed into Poland. Poland did over the coming days mobilize another half a million men, but never managed to organize them properly in time. It never managed to mobilize its entire theoretical pool of reservists. So how would the modern day Poland fare? First let's lay down some ground rules. 1939 Polish borders remain. The entire modern day Polish armed forces with their personnel, equipment, buildings and other infrastructure are magically transported through time and space. Since the borders of modern day Poland don't overlap, some of those assets are placed in new areas, shifting to the east to match the different borders. To make it more fair, there would be no surprise for the Germans. The attackers know their opponents suddenly got weapons from the future, but there are fewer of them. The psychological and sociological effects are all hand-waved as usual in such time-traveling scenarios. Everyone is bent on carrying on their World War II role. The Germans and Soviets still want to conquer. The Poles still want to defend their homeland. The Soviet invasion will be covered in a second video though. The Polish army of today is much much smaller in numbers compared to its 1939 counterpart. It has a core of active army force made up of full-time professional soldiers and a territorial army, mostly a reserve force. The Poles from the future appear on August 29th magically replacing the existing Polish armed forces. That means all Polish weapons, active and reserve army personnel disappear. But Polish civilians can still be mobilized and factories can still produce weapons. On August 29th, the Polish mobilization began but was quickly stopped on request of Allied powers, which were back then still trying to appease Germany. The territorial army and most of the reservists would likely be able to mobilize by the day of the invasion. Knowing they severely lack numbers for a long front line, the modern Polish forces would likely get pulled from the borders and consolidate closer to the center of the country, defending a shorter front line, behind rivers where possible. Germany has shown attacked from several sides. Their northern territories of Danzig and East Prussia made it possible to surround much of Poland. In the real timeline, German forces advanced a few dozen miles during the first few days. But those had to battle their way through. Here the initial organized resistance near the border would be minimal. Would the modern Polish Air Force slow down those advances? If so, first it would need to survive the German Air Force onslaught. An F-16 winning a battle in the air against a Messerschmitt 109 isn't even a question. The Polish plane would fly much higher and would deal with the threats from far away by missiles. But protecting the planes on the ground would be much harder. German air forces going into Poland in 1939 were quite numerous. Polish air forces were quickly dispersed before the war, which the modern-day Polish air force would try to mimic. 
though modern-day fighter jets do require more support than World War II planes, so overall effectiveness of such dispersed units would likely produce less sorties per day than it would otherwise be capable of. Modern Poland gets to use the air bases it has now, as that piece of infrastructure travels through time, but it does make the air force less capable of dispersing. In the real timeline, the Polish Air Force actually managed to hold a similar kill-to-loss ratio over the first few days, performing surprise missions from hidden bases. Until it ran out of supplies, as their bases were overrun on the ground. The last remaining hundred or so Polish planes fled to Romania. The Germans attacked with a force of 300 dive bombers and nearly 800 medium bombers. They usually had some 250 fighters to escort them and another 400 fighters held back to intercept possible Polish attacks. Another 600 fighters and 400 medium bombers were not used in the Polish campaign. They were guarding western and central Germany or were simply under maintenance. The initial German air attack would be tracked by radars from afar and come under massive counterattack. Some confusion would also be experienced due to new targets and new locations and definitely due to Polish missiles. In addition to the Air Force, the ground radar network guiding the SAM systems would take down German planes by the dozens. While modern-day Poland's air defense systems are Cold War-era stuff, in 1939 they would be devastating. They would track the large formations of dozens of German planes and unleash missiles onto the enemy. The Polish Navy also operates two Perry-class frigates, for which they have procured SM-1 missiles from the US. German planes would have no way of knowing they're even under attack until the missiles detonate. Old Soviet stocks of missiles are possibly not that reliable though, so more would be likely to miss than hit. But even if just one quarter of those missiles achieve a hit, the Germans might lose upward of 150 aircraft, mostly bombers to medium altitude SAMs, before the Poles run out of missiles. Shorter range shoulder launch SAMs are much more plentiful in Poland as a domestic missile, the Grom, based on the Soviet Igla design, is being produced. Some 2400 missiles have been produced. Such small SAMs and computer aided anti aircraft artillery, of which Poland does have some, might over time inflict serious losses to German dive bombers, which would have to dive low and directly over the targets. The Polish air forces would have been ready and alerted thanks to radar and initially most of the Polish planes would be ready for action. The primary platforms for fighter missions would be F-16s and MiG-29s. Their stocks of air-to-air -air missiles are fair enough that the Poles could down several German planes per sortie, for several sorties each, before having to resort to guns. Older missiles might malfunction more, but still, against unalerted targets, the modern missiles should enjoy at least 50% if not 90% hit rates. It's likely the first day of the air war would see Polish jets down upward of 200 German planes, mostly bombers. Though within a day or so, the Poles might mostly be out of missiles. Of course, by then the Germans would likely lose upward of 500 combat planes, or more than a third of the total they attacked with. The Luftwaffe might stop using large formations, as those would offer the Poles target-rich areas. Some smaller German groups, attacking the known air bases, might eventually fight through, as the Poles would not have enough planes to keep some in the air all the time, nor enough air defense missiles to continuously protect those air bases. The Polish Air Force might be able to upkeep close to two dozen interceptors in the air for the first few days, then have those figures halved for the rest of the first week. Small German air groups would have a harder time inflicting a lot of damage to Polish planes dispersed around the air bases. Then again, with such low numbers, even a few planes lost per attack could be very costly for Poland. The Luftwaffe would have to back off though, as it couldn't possibly sustain such losses. As the Luftwaffe threat subsides, the Poles would use more of what's left of their air force offensively, attacking those large German army formations. Possibly some of the F-16s would also be spared for that role, as the first week progresses. Poland would use F-16s to do recon work, in addition to using drones. The Scan Eagle drones can loiter up to 20 hours, while the smaller Orbiter and Fly Eye drones can fly for a few hours per mission. As all are launched from catapults, not needing runways, they would provide the Poles with ample warning time on most fronts. The German divisions would not be able to come unnoticed. Polish F-16s would also use guided munitions, though part of those would be less useful due to no GPS signal. 
still entire formations of tanks and groups of German artillery could be attacked with fair precision and virtually no threat to the Poles, inflicting heavy losses to Germans. The Soviet Su-22s and M346 jet trainers would likely suffer somewhat heavier casualties, though those too utilize some stand of guided weapons. But the biggest push against the German formations would likely come in the form of Polish armored formations. With decent situational awareness, the Polish armor would maximize their effectiveness. It's not just about the guns, missiles or armor. The Poles would enjoy modern sensors, much greater engagement ranges, computer-aided aiming and much better data sharing. The Germans mostly relied on very short-range radios, enabling some tactical communication. While jamming of German radios might single-handedly have the biggest effect on their war effort, the modern Polish army is severely lacking in such platforms. It is likely only a fairly small number of German divisions would have their radios jammed. So Poland would use the brute force route. In fact, Poland today has more armored vehicles than Poland had in 1939. Even the fairly poor Soviet-era BMP-1 armored fighting vehicle would in 1939 be a grave threat to the best German tanks with their 73mm guns. Even those Patria APCs with semi-open machine gun nests or the lightly armored BRDMs would be quite a match for the German Panzer I tankette, which was the most numerous German tank back then. And modern Polish tanks would easily reign on the battlefield, achieving precision hits from a few miles away on stationary German targets, and even from a mile away on moving targets. Back then German tanks had to stop to fire. The German armored force would mostly be at the mercy of the Poles. Perhaps the Panzer III or Panzer IV tanks, not very plentiful back then, could enjoy some success against infantry fighting vehicles. Germany had some three and a half thousand tanks back then, sending most of them into Poland. But the Panzer I was basically two machine guns on a lightly armored track platform. The Panzer II was only slightly better with its small gun. Both sides would also have some very basic armored cars with machine guns. The Germans would have their scout cars and the Poles would have armored Humvees and various other rolled armored vehicles which could take a mounted machine gun. A single modern tank or infantry fighting vehicle could very well neutralize up to two dozen targets with its main gun before needing to reload. It's likely the battles would be even more lopsided than the example of the Gulf War tank battle of Easting 73, where the US tanks and IFVs at times fought the Iraqis on their own, going against T-55s through T-72s and against BMP-1s. Artillery played a large role in World War II. Here, the Germans would not be able to use their artillery edge and suppress the defenders. A German infantry division had roughly twice as many artillery guns than a Polish one back in 1939 and today's Polish army has even fewer guns. The difference is, today's Polish artillery is much more precise, with UAVs aiding in aiming, as well as being much more mobile and better protected. Range-wise, modern guns usually significantly outrange the German guns for the same caliber. The 120mm mortar vehicle has a range comparable to the German 75 and even 105mm field guns. Basically, the large discrepancy in gun numbers would over the first few days become insignificant. Polish guns could reach farther without relocating. When needing to relocate, they would do it quicker. And using their anti-artillery radars in the few units that have them, they could also join in in hunting German artillery units. Due to overall mobility of the Polish forces and the inability of the Luftwaffe to control the skies, the Poles would likely dictate the battle attacking where they have superior numbers and retreating where they happen to be outmatched. They would be gradually nibbling away at the vast German infantry numbers as they destroyed the German heavy equipment. The, the Poles might not afford being as mobile as they could be. They would have to conserve diesel fuel as 1939 Poland simply did not have a lot of diesel fuel available. Motorization of the 1939 timeline Polish units was quite poor and a lot of the vehicles they did have used gasoline and not diesel, which today's Polish army predominantly uses. So modern-day Polish forces might have to ease up on using their trucks and moving entire brigades quickly enough so they could save their fuel for combat vehicles. Besides fuel, the Poles would have the issue of numbers. Their army would simply be very low on numbers when it comes to trained infantry. So the coverage on the front line would be quite sporadic and holding the original borders would not be possible, as that would mean spreading the units and the vehicles, however potent they are, too thin, instead of grouping them together for added effectiveness. 
The Polish Grand Army might use the natural obstacles of rivers, such as the Naru in the north and the Warta in the west, and fall behind those lines, using air and artillery attacks to soften up their enemies before they reach the Polish lines, as well as using the armored formations to try and deal with any possible breaches over the rivers. Another piece of technology that would aid the defenders would be the guided anti-tank missile, here probably used against any sort of German vehicle, not just tanks. Poland does have over 3000 Israeli-made spike anti-tank guided missiles. Attack helicopters could help as well, though they are of Cold War vintage and might get shot down occasionally, as their fairly poor sensors and missiles would sometimes mean they would have to get fairly close to the enemy. During the first week, Poland might be able to mobilize a few hundred thousand volunteers into the army. But still, such units would largely be just decoys and cannon fodder, not to be used offensively. That role would not be useless though, as Germans would, when scouting, still see potentially several times more soldiers on the Polish lines, slowing down their progress as they decide where to attack. Devoid of much of their heavy and mobile weapons, the Germans would find it very hard to progress beyond the rivers that the Poles would protect. The Poles would likely not have enough forces to push the Germans back on all fronts, but the one front they would likely attack would be in the north. A large armored push might follow the eastern bank of the Vistula River and sever the Germans in the east, while the rest of the forces slowly encircle them and push them against the sea. By ultimately dealing with the northern front, Poland might trade the original front line, 220 miles long, for a 130 mile long front along Vista River, up to the sea, and the initial armored push along the river might help the Polish navy survive. Still, the navy would largely be inconsequential to the greater war effort. But more about that in the next video. During the second week of the war, the Germans would likely be paralyzed. They would have lost control of East Prussia, where perhaps large pockets of resistance would be left. There, hundreds of thousands of German troops might remain, but with only basic firearms left and increasingly short on supplies. The German attacks throughout the rest of the front would usually result in bloody defeats. Germany would be short on vehicles and sending more in would likely be seen as wasteful. So they would likely stay put, using their numerical advantage in infantry to protect their sides of the rivers and ponder their next move. By the start of week 3, the German invasion would have stalled. But would the Poles be able to celebrate is a different question. History may have not been changed yet, as the Soviet Union would have attacked the exhausted Poles from the other side. More about that though in another video. Before we go, here's another short look at Call of War. The game is free to play, but that doesn't mean it's a simple game. There's layers of depth to it. You're basically leading a whole country and managing it in a war-torn world. You invest in technology and economy and modernize your army units. There's all sorts of units available, artillery, fighters, bombers, you name it. And the technology tree can lead you all the way to the atomic bomb. Even smaller countries can, through your leadership, change the course of history and become powerhouses in their own right, conquering the world. Way to go, Belgium! Shrewd diplomacy will help you gain allies and manage multiple fronts, carving up the spoils of war with others. So, click that link below the video and try the game for free! And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.